What's going on, guys? This is Joe Tallarico, and you're listening to the AHA Moment Podcast, where we dive deep into closing that mind action gap of idea to execution and all the little knit and grit that's in between. On today's episode, we have Anna Burnaby, a hair and makeup stylist for male celebrities and models. We're going to get into how she got into that profession, as well as all insights she's gotten, both good and bad along the way, and how she almost cut her roommate's ear off. Check it out. All right. So, Anna, tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, what you do. I'm a um, men's hairstylist and groomer. And I work with a lot of talent and I guess I've been doing this since 2004, I believe. How did you get into that? What were you doing before? That's a very good question. Um, basically, I got into it when I used to work at a um, bag licensing company and I was the like it was like a postgraduate job where I didn't have quite a job description, but um, I produced the photo shoots there and I would hire the models um, and I also decided to hire hair and makeup. And um, when I saw what they did, I was just, I was in love with like their job. And so I, um, from that point on, I assisted hair and makeup people for about seven years. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you had no experience cutting hair, doing anything at all. It was just something you jumped into yes. and something you, an interest you found and got into it. Those seven years, how much of a learning curve was that? Oh, it was, it was a lot. Um, you know, I was just so excited just to, be, just to see the process, just to, um, see like how fashion shoot works and just to see the transformation of models um like how um each makeup artist and each hairstylist um got from point a to point b um and it was also really um there were moments where i just felt like you know questioning my career because i'm just like oh my god like i'm waiting you know six months to a year for like a hundred dollar paycheck you know um because it was my you know first experience um or my introduction into being a freelancer um so it so many things were happening but i feel like um every assistant job that i did was like it was just a new experience um yeah i don't know if i yeah. And for those who don't know, any type of freelance job, like there's no guaranteed paycheck. You're always hoping for more work. And the biggest thing I think of right away is what is the friend and family vibe from something like that? Because the moment I know when I've gotten into any freelance type of work, you know, people are obviously skeptical because we come from a society where people want, you know, like get a nine to five steady paycheck, work for retirement. So to do seven years in something that's every day, not guaranteed for seven years, yeah. how, what was the first, um, questions that like family and friends had and resistance and how did you overcome those? Well, it's so funny because I'm um, talking to like, like one of my best friends now, I remember a few years ago, she reminded me, she was like, do you remember when I told you like, Anna, are you sure this is the right thing that you want to do? Um, she was like, she reminded me that she was that voice of reason. Like, like, and I think the reason why she brought it up was I didn't listen to her. Like, I had my focus straight on and I could have, like, you know, made myself small and been like, you know what, you're right. Like, what am I doing? Like, and question, you know, this... Um, unstable type of lifestyle but I guess at the time and you know I just saw the light at the end of the tunnel like I focused on that like I just knew that I could never work in an office again like no <laughs> that's a huge moment in itself there because I'm sure tons of people we all have that moment if we're not following what interests us that we just want to get out of that rat race we want to be doing something different but we just don't know how to make that leap or we don't even like we don't even know what makes it feasible to even follow through so the fact that you had such like a clear set vision is huge was there 
anything going on at that time that helped with that? Because I know some people might be wondering, like, how could you, how does someone get so focused on something so unpredictable? I guess I just knew that I, I enjoyed being on set. I love being on photo shoots. I love being on different locations. I love um, always meeting new crews of people. Um, that excitement definitely was addictive. Just like knowing that there's just, it's just like always a new possibility. Um, but also I was really, <laughs> I was really young and I, you know, was very, uh, I guess you could say, uh, uh, careless with my credit card. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I built up a lot of debt. But that just for like, um, the equipment you needed for doing that? It or? was just, just to live in New York city. Okay. Wow. You know, was like, you know, I, I built up my credit card debt and, and, you know, to sustain that lifestyle of just, you know, being an assistant. Um, but at the same time, I also just felt like th it's crazy. I still felt like I was doing the right thing. <laughs> and not to mention, this is also at a different time period than yeah. now. This is at a time where like YouTube wasn't big. There weren't all these easy no. tech startup ways to no. get going. No one had podcasts like this. You didn't, it's harder for someone, especially entering a realm like that to just find inspiration, you know, yeah. at least with acting, you could say, Oh, here are a couple actors that I like that I'm going to follow. But in this case, I mean, I don't know much about the hair and makeup area, but I'm yeah. sure there's not a huge, at least at that time, a huge pool to pick from. Um, if anything, it was just like magazines okay. and, um, agencies. And, you know, when you're living in New York, um, the beauty of living there is like the best of the best live there. Yeah. Like every best, you know, major makeup artists and major hairstylists they all live there so i knew that like if i could just cold call um you know every single agency that existed in new york city even though i didn't even have a portfolio or anything i just wanted to be on that roster for assistance um you know anything to just kind of get my foot in the door that's what i did yeah and how are those cold calls because i know some people that's got to be a lot of rejection. Some people aren't good. Maybe they can handle one or two, but I'd imagine you made a lot and that's got to be something to overcome. Yeah, it was crazy. I mean, it was amazing that, you know, there were agencies where um, they were so open to it. There was agencies that says, no, we don't need anyone. There were some that just didn't even respond at all. Um, so either way, I just felt like it worked out. And, you know... Um, word of mouth is everything. So like once you build up a relationship with like, you know, a photographer team or like, you know, assisting, um, you know, this one makeup artist, that person, you know, refers you to someone else or so it's just, there was, there was definitely a lot of possibility. So how long into that seven year internship or learning yeah. experience, I would say, did it like when in that time period, did you start making those calls? Was that right at year one? Was that oh, after year, a couple of years? Like okay. The first, Wow. you know, when I realized I don't want to work in, you know, this bag licensing company, I want to, you know, at, at the time I didn't want to, I didn't know anything about men's hairstyle or <laughs> grooming. That wasn't even, um, my goal at the time early on. My goal was to be like a makeup artist, a fashion makeup artist. And, um, by doing that, I knew that I had to like figure out, okay, which makeup artist do I think the work is like amazing. Yeah. And then from there, I, it's like, I did my own sleuthing, you know, I looked it up like, okay, that person's represented by this agency. I even, you know, tried to find their number on a phone book. I even <laughs> got one makeup artist, like, you know, her personal number and called her and wow. just, give, you know, just introduced myself and said, I would love to assist you. And what so. was their response? Um, you know, one person was just like, yes, come, let's meet for coffee. Um, another person was just like, actually, I do need a hand. You know, there's no money, but, you know, it's a great way to, to meet. So there was, there was definitely a lot of opportunities. Okay. Yeah. And were you, when you finally hit that or found that um, person to shadow under, was it unpaid to start or were you getting paid to start? 
It was both. Okay. It was both. Some one time I made fifty dollars, <laughs> you know, for a full day, wow. you know, and then another time I made two hundred dollars. You know, it's okay. just it was just assistant rates. You know, yeah. I think at the time my intention was just to get as much experience as possible. I didn't care about the money, um, and that also bit me in the ass too. But at the same time, I just. I just wanted experience. Like I wanted to understand, like how how do you get the skin texture to look this way, or how how do you even put on eyeliner? You know, like just simple things. The reason I bring that up is you made a couple good points. There is when you find something you're interested enough in, as you were saying, you'll you didn't care about them, and you'll do what it takes to learn those skills. Mm. The other thing I picked up on within that is. The biggest thing for anyone trying to pursue what is they're interested in and just have no clue, like in her case, what the first step even is, is to find someone who's doing work that you like. Like, I love that you mentioned that you didn't just grab the first person you saw because, you know, that you can throw something at the wall and see what sticks. But why not find someone who's where you want to be in five, ten years and see if you can work under them? Because that's where you're going to learn the most and especially towards the style you want. So that's awesome that you've already knew right away is there anything was that just something you naturally knew to do I had like what made you realize like if I'm going to do this this is the way it needs to be done I guess that I don't know maybe it was just like having like those punk rock like you know do-it-yourself roots where you know just go straight to the source yeah you know there was no magic behind it it's just kind of like pound the pavement you know if this is the person that you want to work with reach out to that person period that like that's I guess that was like you know something that I learned from the group of friends that I hung out with in high school like just very just kind of like you know point a to point b that's that's it and in terms of like dealing with the yeses and nos particularly the rejections how either through that experience or through your childhood growing up, how did you get used to being able to handle that type of thing? Because there might be some people that aren't used to rejection. It, you know, I have to say, um, I'm like almost 40. And I have to say, it's actually still a practice. You know, okay. there's still a lot of moments where um, I feel like finally now um, I accept it like okay. um it took a long time for me to because you know to this day i'm still like you know you know up up for a job and there's two other people like colleagues of mine that are up for the same job and there's no rhyme or reason you can't i would stress out like why didn't i get the job and you know she got it or blah 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 and it's like um learning to accept rejection is like probably one of the biggest things that um took a while for me to um learn and when I was younger when I first started I took it so it that's what held me held me back I took it to heart so much okay interesting so yeah I took it personally yeah Yeah. so it definitely (laughs) wasn't easy in the beginning which I'm sure anyone starting off anything especially if it's something that's not your wheelhouse you're going to get rejected a lot because the experience isn't there. The resume is not there. And as you heard from her, she's doing well now, but <laughs> it's not like she went in with that mindset of like, Oh, I don't care if I get rejected. I can keep moving on. You know, we're not, not everyone can have that shield and feel invincible. So the fact that she learned to overcome that over the years is huge. And so let me ask you this sure. it, in the beginning, it was hard. How did you overcome that? Oh my gosh. Um, in the beginning, how did I overcome yeah, that? Yeah, like how- the times were like you were in the beginning oh where you gosh. didn't know all the stuff about like face failure, learn to grow. How did you that's cope a with very, that? That's a very good question. Um, I feel like that's probably what took a lot of time in between. Um, I wasted a lot of time just kind of dwelling like, you know, was my portfolio not right? Or did I, you know, like making up stories in my head of why they didn't hire me to assist this person and why did this other person become their first assistant or you know it's just I I can't believe I look back and I can't believe that all the times that I have been rejected and dwelled on it more than just kind of like you know moving forward maybe that's why I assisted for seven (laughs) years instead of like three yeah yeah (laughs) but that brings up a good point though I'm actually I'm glad you gave the answer you did because I'm sure 
people were thinking like, oh, she must have had some sort of golden rule she ended up following to get through that. But the fact that it wasn't a golden rule, you just kind of like, you didn't have the experience. No one taught you about growth mindset or embrace failure. So it's just kind of you buckling down and just like, I've got to get through this and figure out a way to do it. So that's awesome that it was just, it was a learning curve. It was, you know, it's not, everyone's going to have it all from the beginning. And that shows that (laughs) sometimes you can't be a hundred percent ready for something. You got to be 80% of the way there and figure it out as you go. And as you could see when it came to failure and rejection, which is huge for anyone, as it went with her over those seven years, it was a process. Even up to this day, it's been, you said, what, 15 years now you've been doing this? Yeah. 15 years and she's still oh, learning. Yeah. Still learning, still being rejected. I, I, and <laughs> and I, that's just normal. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's, but I think that's good to note because anyone who's trying to f- switch to that interest and pursue it and is listing, I know I do this, all the reasons why it's not going to work and all the things they're going to do wrong, you're hearing here right now, you're not going to have it all figured out. So don't wait for the perfect plan. Just get it started and figure it out as you go and f- have that support system. Do the best that you can for the contingencies as they come up, but don't s- overstress that you don't even begin. Yeah. So that's big. I agree with you on that. <laughs> so then now what would you say is the um, the turning point from this is what I want to do, now I'm actually going to do it? Because it's one thing to say it, and some people, sure. it's easy. They can just jump right into something the yeah. next day. But others, they could put it off for weeks and not do it. I think the turning point, like, in my career, because, I, like I said, it, my goal wasn't to be a men's hairstylist. That, that was actually not my goal. Um, what was your goal? To be a makeup artist. Okay, so just strictly... Just to do women's makeup. But here's what happened. The story is, is that at the time, like, men's grooming wasn't even a thing. You know, a lot of makeup artists, um, you know, uh, did jobs, did the men's grooming jobs, but it wasn't something that was like prized. So as an assistant, I always got the men's grooming (laughs) jobs. They're like, hey, do you want to do this men's grooming job? Sure. You know, because I was so green and excited. I was just like, I'll take whatever job I could do. So then did that kind of put you, would you say at the time period it happened because you were saying it wasn't the sought after one compared to doing women's that it kind of puts you ahead of the game a little bit because you were, I never thought of it that way, but I feel like because every, I was getting the spillover, (laughs) like, um, doing all these men's fashion shoots and everything. I feel like, um, yeah, look in retrospect, I was just like that definitely, um, gave me so much practice, um, to get to where I'm at now. So, I've always like, you know, had like a men's section in my portfolio. Yeah. Um, but I my but my, at the time my goal was like I'm a makeup artist. I'm a makeup artist. And then the men's section just kept getting bigger and bigger. And I also learned it's not about the makeup really. It's about learning how to do men's hair. Yeah. So then I'm like, holy shit, like I got more excited and like experimental and creative with um you know, manipulating and, and, um, working with men's hair because, you know, so many clients are just, you know, just didn't understand that like, Oh, you know, he just needs a little powder or whatever. I show up on set and it's like, he needs a whole other hairstyle. You know, they just, it was just never explained. So it's kind of like I was thrown in there and then through the process, I had to learn how to, you know, style men's hair, which is like a whole other world. Yeah. Um, And then from there, uh, one of my best friends, who's a talented hairstylist, I guess from him outside looking in, he was just like, Anna, I really think you should just be a men's groomer. And how long into, (laughs) how many, within the 15 year span, what year was this at? Oh God, that was about 2000, I think this was like at the tail end of me assisting. Okay. And, um... He, when he told me that, we laugh about it to this day um, because I cursed him out. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I took it personally. I was so offended that, you know, like he didn't see me um, as a talented makeup artist. Like he saw me as a talented, I, I interpreted what he was telling me completely wrong. 
Well, because at that time, time, it was all about doing women's women's makeup. So to say men's, because it was so pushed to the side, it was almost like, oh, so you don't think I can do this. (laughs) Exactly. So he said something very powerful and because we were in my apartment and he goes, I want you to take a look at your bookshelf. And I'm just like, okay. And he goes, what magazines do you have on your bookshelf? And I had just collections, like a decade's worth of like details magazine, GQ magazine, you know, and like numero ohm and like, you know, (laughs) all the Italian and French men's magazines. And he goes, I don't know any makeup artist that has this many men's magazines and not a single woman's Vogue, you know, mag. and I, and it just kind of like, it's just like everything kind of like sped up at that second. And I just felt like, holy shit like this was in my subconscious the whole time like i've always been fascinated by men's fashion and um you know men's hair it just it was sitting right in front of me i didn't i didn't collect a single women's magazine yeah and you don't realize there's a niche for it especially when it's not a market at all right and i i mean there was only like a handful of men's groomers at the time and i just thought to myself holy shit like it, it was kind of like an overnight like moment and I got back to him I was like oh my god you're right and he was just like he was so sassy with me because Uh, like because I because we got into like you know I kind of got emotional and was like and um and then from that point on um my intention shifted and I became so laser focused. Wow. So it heightened you to another level. Totally. Cause I was just like, I embraced the shit out of just being like, yeah, like I'm, this is who I am. And from that point on, um, he was just like, you got to learn how to cut men's hair. And I was like, uh, you know, I start doubting myself. Like, I I don't know where to begin. I'm too scared to go to these like, you know, ghetto barber schools. That resistance comes up again. Yeah. I was just like, Oh, oh no, 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 no. Like I, I'm, I can't, I can't, I'm scared. And he just kept pushing me and he was just like, you have an eye, you have an eye for this. He was like, you don't need to go to school. You could do this. You could do this. And I was like, it just hearing that support was, and coming from someone who I respected so much as a hairstylist and not only as a friend, um, it just, it just really, really resonated with me. And um, so then I was just like, okay, you know, I bought my first pair of shears. I had no direction. I didn't know how to like section hair. I didn't know anything. And I was like, if I could style it, I'm sure I could cut it. So my roommate. Oh no, this cannot (laughs) end well. Was my first guinea pig. So up to this point, never cut a man's hair before in your life. Never, never, never. The first scissors you got. Sharpest. And this is of, the first victim. Yeah, first victim, sharpest pair of uh, you know shears, and um and my roommate was so sweet and he was just like yeah whatever like you could totally practice on me, and I was like awesome, and I don't know what kind of technique I did, I cut his ear. You cut I his literally, which isn't even part. It's on <laughs> your head, but it's yeah. I oh my god, I I cut the the top part of his ear so the it was like a horror show like the (laughs) blood was pulsating out like in spurts and he had a white cape on it was going all over the cape and was he was he he screaming in pain the funny thing was is that he was really calm about it he was like anna uh you know he was grabbing his ear he's like i think you cut my ear i panicked and locked myself in the bathroom. Oh, no. <laughs> Meanwhile, he's trying to plug that ear going, I still support you even though I'm dying and need to go to a hospital. I I locked myself in the bathroom. <laughs> yeah. I can't believe I did that too because I, I just, I, I, and then there was a part of me that was just like, I'm not meant to do this. This is not, this is obviously not meant for me. He's uh, unfortunately passed away that day. So <laughs> <Right>. we... <laughs> Shout out to uh, him no longer living. <laughs> no, I'm sure he's but fine. It was um, actually. What does he think now? You oh know, years later, now that you're what, thriving. What's amazing is is that he's let me after that experience. He still let me practice on wow. him. Wow. So I got, and he, you know, he's half Korean. So 
Asian hair, as you know, it's it's tricky. Like it's really, really tough yeah. to to learn on because if you make a mistake, you could really see it. And so, um, yeah, like it became really awesome. Like I I learned from the best because it was actually really hard to cut his hair. Yeah. So yeah. And he probably figured, well, if getting my hair cut, that's the worst <laughs> it gets. So it can only get better from here. <laughs> yeah. So. That's, That's cool, though. Yeah, and so from that point on, it just kind of like my, the tra- trajectory of my career went a whole other direction. That's wild. Yeah. At the end, what I was thinking of while you were telling that story, which is so interesting, is the same thing I learned moving out here to California from New Jersey was I always liked being in the fitness industry. But at the time, I had such a limited view where it's like, oh, you can either be a bodybuilder, but then you've got to be a no name or you've got to be on fitness covers. There are only like f- certain finite ways to get to the quote unquote end goal. I didn't realize there are so many other smaller niches or even niches that don't exist that you can create. So the fact that like, and that again, the whole don't wait till you're a hundred percent to get started, just get started. You'll figure it out along the way. That's the perfect reason why, because it's most definitely going to change your trajectory. Mm -hmm. She went in going in wanting to do women's hair and now it ended up being men's hairstyle. And not only that, because she just went for it and took the jobs that no one else wanted, it created an edge for her to have by taking advantage of that opportunity that no one else had, which none of this, keep in mind, she would have had unless she did all these things of just right. going for it, taking whatever she could get, following, having someone to mentor under, and all those things. So that's mm-hmm. huge. I think people really need to appreciate that moment there because whatever it is you're pursuing, there are certain times, I know even for myself, maybe an event comes up or I see a client I need to train or something where I'm just like, eh, I don't feel like training them, but you never know where that moment can lead. That's where oppor- uh, success is opportunity meets luck, right? That who knows what can happen in that moment. It might not be nothing, but if it could be something, why waste the moment? Especially if you're not yeah. doing anything else aimed towards that goal. Absolutely. That's big. Yeah. <laughs> now, how, how is it now based on what you've learned over the years? How has the, the realm changed in your industry um well now everyone wants to be a men's hairstylist see that's crazy and again to be ahead of that now or at least not ahead of it but you know having the experience that other people didn't gather because you were doing that every there's so many um there's uh, so many successful men's hairstylists men's groomers um And I feel like, you know, the men's market, like, you know, especially after Mad Men, the show, um, like every there's a barbershop everywhere, you know, like it kind of created. It helped create or like, uh, what do you call it when you um, not revisit, but there's a word where it just like it became popular again for men to just be like, hey, I should style my hair. I should put a little bit more attention to, um, you know, the details. Um, so from mass market to luxury products, there's so many men's hair care lines and skincare lines and, you know, you thank all the hipsters for that, for all the different quaffs and growing the beards out. mm -hmm. Now you got to take care of the beard. You got to get an edge on the side of your head to get a nice line. So market marketable right now. It's, it's crazy. So yeah, it's, I mean, it's a, you know, it's a, amazing you know market i suppose like because there's just so much options now for men to um either you know youtube and you know buying something as cheap you know at cvs for men's products or you know going high end and you know getting something super expensive you have so many options yeah how now if you had to start all over again and enter the industry now what would you do different because of the way the landscape has changed? How would you, if if you had any idea at all, what would you, what would be the first thing you did? Would you still try and find that apprentice? Is it different now? I, you know, it's that's a really really good question. And to be honest with you, um, when I I would I would do the exact same thing over again, because the people that have contacted me to assist me remind me of me. I was like, <laughs> wow, you went out of your way to look at my work and to acknowledge what I do and, um, you know, want to take me out for coffee. Do you know how many people I took out for coffee? Um, because I just wanted 
I wanted to acknowledge them and and just have at least 10 minutes just to be like, you know, how did how did you get to point A to point B? Um, And I want to make it worth their time. You know, I didn't want I didn't want them to have to go out of the way to see me in New York. You know, I made sure I went straight to them and was like, let me buy you lunch. You know, I had no money. I was just like, I'll just charge it on my card. And um, because I, I, I was that eager and I feel like the same thing applies nowadays. Like if your intention is clear and you did your research, because like there's a lot of people who've hit me up and I'm like, you totally cut and paste this email. <laughs> like it sounds so inauthentic. Like you probably sent this email to like 20 other men's groomers. You know what I mean? Yeah. And just switch the name, you know? So I feel like just being yourself and, and you know, making it personal and making it feel like you know you really really do respect this person you do want to learn from this person yeah authenticity i've noticed is huge because you also got to keep in mind any job you're doing it doesn't have to be hair and makeup anything um if you're trying to look for a career and eventually be working within that career or within a certain crew or building whatever they say you spend more time with the people you work with than the people you do at home. Mm -hmm. So knowing that when people are hiring, it's not necessarily about experience or how smart this person is, Mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. It's going to be about, do I get along with this person? Mm -hmm. What, who are they like? So it can only behoove you to act a hundred percent yourself because I've had it. I've done internships where I, I had it set in my mind. I was like, I could definitely nail this internship where I would get a job. Like so convinced, not in a cocky way, just, I knew I had the skill set and everything to back it up. And then I went through the internship and I just realized I just, I'm not either, I'm not getting along with the people or they're not getting along with me or whatever it is. There's just the gelling is not happening even to where if I knew for sure, they'd be like, Oh, they're going to ask me for a job after this. I was almost a hundred percent convinced. If not, I was convinced that I wouldn't accept it because you know, I got to think I'm going to be spending the next X amount of years with these people. Mm-hmm. It might kill my visions of how much I love this field that I'm in or where I'm working. And so I just didn't want to do that. So that's huge. And knowing what you said about taking everyone out to coffee, catering to them. Yes. When you're starting out in the field, you got to do those things. That mm-hmm. is so important. It's mm-hmm. not about kissing ass. No. It's about being authentic, like yeah. you said. And in order for someone, because you got to figure, if you're trying to apprentice someone, mm-hmm. chances are they're doing pretty successful for themselves. They're very busy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So how are you, the things to think about are, how are you going to make their life easier? Mm-hmm. And what kind of potential can you show that like you really want to do this? Because mm-hmm. I'm sure they've got plenty of people that are trying to hit them up for all sorts of reasons, whether it's just to mooch off of them or yeah. to try and get that apprenticeship off of them. But it, you know, they're not showing that they care that they want it. They just like the end goal of oh, well, you know, I just like the money they make, so I want to do that. Mm -hmm. So they got to see that, yeah, you're in it for the right reason. So that's huge that you mentioned all those things, and it um, deserves reiterating because you want to make sure that you find the people you want, research them, like you said, like Mm -hmm. know what's going on, Mm -hmm. know the ins and outs of what they did Mm because they'll respect that. When they see you put the time in, you're that much more worth having. You want to be indispensable. So that's that's big. That's very big. It's interesting because like while hearing you talk about that I also think that um in the line of work that we all do but uh, particularly someone who does hair so um what I find in you know as a segue to what you're saying is that I work with new talent all the time and I have to build trust with that person within like milliseconds true that's I didn't even think about that like so quickly that person may not have looked at my portfolio that pay, that person you know may had a bad experience before with you know a groomer you don't know what they're com- you know coming in with so i have it's it's amazing how uh the longer i've been in this business um and working with talent particularly um and just people in general <laughs> It's really, really about trust. You could be the least talented hairstylist or the most talented hairstylist. Doesn't matter. The talent has to feel comfortable. You just you. have to, f- they, that person has to trust you, period. Especially if, like in your case, when you're doing hair and makeup for someone and they're going to be on TV for millions to see, like sure. that's, that's a lot of responsibility. It's a lot. And um, 
it took me a while to figure that out. Um, and so, so does um, that mean your first interactions with, when you got to work with celebrities was, was it a little awkward or was like, it was so awkward. Oh my God. It was just, you know, I think for a good amount of years, I was a robot, you know, I just felt like maybe if I just become a robot, you know, like be, be really good at what I do, like, you know, mechanically or whatever, like that's just get the job done. Yeah. And then I realized like, no, it's not about that, Anna. Like, it's about like, like being yourself for sure you know expanding being authentic and being vulnerable um and um of course you know being warm and 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 just truly truly um making that person like if i feel comfortable in my own shoes yeah then it allows everybody around me you know the publicist the client the art director the photographer it allows the whole environment around me to trust me and I don't think we uh, brought this up earlier. So when you book these gigs, in case anyone's wondering, it's not like she herself is just placing him. She's with an agency and they book her sure. to the client. So yeah. to go back to like making him feel real comfortable real quick, that's all the more important now because mm -hmm. it's not like the person who's getting their hair done knows Anna and says like, oh, I want to book her. Yeah. She's coming in. It's at least for the first time. Sure. It's you coming in. They don't know who you are. They yeah. know nothing about you. So it's like for sure, especially if you're making me look good, I want to at least who are you? Like, I want to yeah. know that, you know, this will be comfortable, this, not awkward. <laughs> and, um, it's definitely, um, I've learned so much and it took me a while. So like for anybody, you know, who's new at this, um, you know, looking to assist or, you know, is currently doing this, it's all about working on just trusting yourself first. Yeah. And what you can bring to the table, Trust personality wise yourself. and skill. -wise. Exactly. Because then when you, trust yourself and ground yourself then that's when the magic happens with everybody else like it's because um man like <laughs> it's it it really it because i mean there's so many people that uh, you just can't believe like the the level of like oh okay like you know that's how their hair is or you know like or whatever but you know what they trust that person you know and they feel amazing and i think at the end of the day, um, you know, my job is to empower people and empower my clients. And I, and it's, it, at first I was just like, oh, you know, I could do this cool technique and blah, blah. And like, you know, I, I used to think of it as just like all in the mechanics. And um, now I realized it's, it's all empowerment. It's all empowerment. Like I'm there to serve them because they are, serving you know millions of people you know like with whatever art that they are producing like musician or you know actor or even a model they're representing a campaign you know so it's or an athlete um so basically you know my, my job is just to to like kind of like support their empowerment of course you know? yeah have you are you now at the point in your career yet where since you're more established that there's new up and comers trying to apprentice under you has that oh, happened yeah, yet sure. oh, okay yeah, yeah there's definitely you know people who've helped me out and um yeah and that's also like a learning process too because i was just i see myself in them you know where i'm just like god i i remember um being in your shoes you yeah. know but i also realize like you know at at the new generation of people who are, you know, you could say like assisting or apprenticing. Um, it's so different because, you know, like you said before, there's so many options now that like you can, yeah. you, I mean, I still YouTube things just to <laughs> learn, you know, how other people get from point A to point B, like with a haircut. Um, so there's just so much more available information to receive. Um, so I feel like, you know, that's great to like speed up the process of just like learning and, you know, executing. Do you get to, uh, do they just kind of give you the people that are printed under you? Do you get to choose them yourself? How does that, how does that? I, I, I choose. Okay. Like, like I feel like. Um, so now you're on the other it, side of no, that. Yeah. Like I feel like, you know, like it's, it's just, you know, like anything else. Like, do I trust this person? Do I know that this person will will be respectful on set or with my clients um you know i i want to feel like 
I don't have to worry that this person is going to like, you know, change the vibe of like, you know, what, cause it's, you know, when you work with talent, especially, um, it's a very personal thing, you know, it's like you're in their space. I'm touching their skin. I'm touching their, I'm, I'm, you know, you're in a, a hairstylist groomer is the, you know, second most intimate person than their significant other, you know? So it's just like, it's very, very, you know, um, private. Okay. Yeah. And so you pretty much mentioned a couple of things there. So now you get to see, and I'm assuming you kind of based it off of what you were trying to bring when you were, um, looking for mentors was the different types of traits and stuff that these people have in order to qualify or mm-hmm. who you'd want actually working around you. Mm-hmm. It's good to note because again, you know, it all comes back around is mm-hmm. this is all the more reason you want why you want to have these things. It's not like that mentor is any different than you in most cases. Sure. They probably just want the same similar things that you wanted, which is respect, you know, being comfortable. Everyone just wants to feel comfortable because mm-hmm. a lot of times you're in the talents places or you're just, mm-hmm. you know, you're like you said, you're working with them right at their face. So yeah. that's big. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have anyone like who's been your biggest influence just throughout your life in general that might've played a big role in this might not necessarily be related in the field, but, um, um, well lately, like, um, well, okay. I, I'll just say just a few things that came off the top of my head. Um, I've always like, as far as just like, influence um career wise i've huge idols are losi fucking most talented most awesome you know men's groomer um and is Meredith, that like i don't know much about like this field is the, that like the the beyonce yes, of the of men's grooming yes. but she's also she's also paired up with um mirachai who's oh, just like hands down like i mean have you had to meet them I've met both of them. It was Ooh, like, like okay. starstruck. You know, <laughs> More than the them. celebrities like, themselves. Exactly. Like, like I kind of freaked them out because I was like, oh my God, you know, like yeah. I, I've, you know, I've seen their names, you know, on every editorial and, you know, and I was just like, who are they? Who are they? Like, I can't wait one day I get to meet them. And, you know, finally I meet them and I'm just like, oh my God, like this is, you're, it's just, you're starstruck, you know, like these are people that you wanted to follow, follow in their footsteps. Um, so, um, them, and then, um, currently I, I totally, um, believe in the teachings of Tara Brock and Dr. Wayne Dyer and Josh Corda. Like, those are the people that I feel like, um, I can just listen to anytime, every day and just feel, uh, very grounded and balanced, um, and, um, continue practicing, um, uh, just being very zen about yeah. um, my life. You know, For those who don't know, uh, Tara Brock and Wayne, they do stuff that helps with a lot of mind shit. Mm-hmm. Mind, not mind, shit. <laughs> mind, mind shift. <laughs> well, maybe mind shit too, but <laughs> totally. mind shifting of, you know, like like she was saying, learning over the years how to embrace failure and how to be more calm in, in the face of failure and handling situations. Because things, I'm sure, especially in her field, never are going to go the way you expect them to go. Mm-hmm. Things are always going to change. So it's about you, if you don't already know how to, constantly learning and continuing to learn how to make sure you can handle those mm-hmm. situations, even if it's 10% better than you were before, because yeah. you need that to have that calm presence when you do finally work with the client or talent. Mm-hmm. So that's big. Yeah. Nice. Are there any other uh, books you're reading right now aside from, from those two? Um, let me think. The, I love The Art of Possibility. That book is amazing. The Four Agreements, amazing. Um, the Power of Intention. And these are books that I reread. Like, I could just flip to any page in any of those books and just be like, oh, like, you know, like certain things hit home like a year later or two years from now. Then it's like, it's amazing what you can like um, take in, even though you've read that book already. You know, it's just like sometimes at different points in your life, you understand something more than you did the first time. So, yeah. How'd you like power of intention? Oh my God. I, I feel like intention is everything, you know, anything and everything that you like want to manifest in your life, you know, things don't happen. Like it drives me insane when people say, I'll believe it when I see it. 
I want to strangle them. Yeah. Because you have to believe it already yeah. to see it. Yeah. Like you can't just self fulfilling prophecy if you don't. Yeah, because I'm just like you'll be skeptical for the rest of your life, and I and it it just drives me insane. I think that like, you know, if someone you know were to tell me like, sweetie, you know, you're gonna max out your credit card for you know thirty thousand dollars, you're gonna be in debt, and you know, um waiting for a paycheck you know for a hundred dollars and some paychecks you didn't even get like you sure you want to do this you know it's just that wasn't my intention you know my intention is just like yes like I see myself like you know doing really well and being really successful working on like awesome photo shoots and like you know being creative and like sharing that with other people um so I feel like there's no you know, believe it when you see it type of thing. It's just like you have to like um, almost experience or experience it already before it happens. Okay. Um, I feel like that's like every, you know, um, cover shoot that I've, I've um, accomplished in my life. I feel like it already happened, yeah. which sounds crazy. Like, I just feel like I knew it was going to happen. That's awesome. You know, it's just kind of like that was part of my intention. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I think it helps with that follow through too because if you really have that strong power of intention, it allows you to build off of that and focus on the positive and focus on what needs to be done versus making habits of focusing on negatives. Definitely. I mean, and not to say, like, there, of course, there's so many days where sure. you could fall down that rabbit hole, but, um, you know, it's everything is a practice and you're just like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm, back on track again um and it's just that's just forever you know life you know there's so many you know plot twists and curveballs that will be thrown at you and it's just a matter of you know sticking with your intention and um and believing in it yeah really truly what are some just to kind of wrap up here going back to that beginning when you were struggling doing the freelancing mm -hmm. and trying to make a paycheck I know some people wonder like how, like what advice would you give to those people in terms of like build, like the thought of like, oh, I'm going to build up debt and stuff like that, that alone, just hearing that they might say, oh, I'm yeah, not going to do it. Is far. there a way to like cope with that? Or I'm trying to think of what the right question would be in terms of like the mindset to have, I guess, when the inevitable happens, when something unfortunate it doesn't have to necessarily be that exact thing, but when something, when a setback happens, how you kind of stay on track and not let that bog you down? That's a good question. Um, trusting, trusting the process. Just know, just reminding yourself that it always work, that it will always work out. Um, however, one thing that I do want to address is um, also um, what helped me in my career was the business side. <laughs> Like, okay. I always thought, oh, my gosh, you know, like they should they should notice me because of my work. My work speaks for itself. No, it, that, <laughs> that is not true. Yeah. Um, yes. You know, a portfolio is amazing and all that. But who's going to know your portfolio if you don't know how to reach out to people? Exactly. So there's a method um, that one of my friends um, taught me in order to um, uh, basically land the plane. You know, and so it was it's just quite genius. It's just simply going through your list of contacts and having um, one column, just writing out every person that you've worked with. So like, you know, I, you know, did a job with Calvin Klein. I did a job with, you know, just every person that you've gotten paid from. Make that list, then make a list of people that you want to work with and you have a friend in common. So like, you know, I always wanted to work with Sam, but um, he doesn't know me, but I know you. So we we share you in common. So like have that list. And then the third co list would be um, people who you have nothing in common, but you know who they are and you just have to work with them, you know? Yeah. Like so basically it's um, what me and my friend called um, married dating and crush <laughs> so those are three those are our three lists yeah and so um and this is before i had an agent so i was my own agent 
And um, this system really, really helped me every day, five personal emails to five people from those lists. And just, just it's basically just your, my intention was just to put myself out there and to um, put my name into people's, like the first thing that they see, you know, when they open up their email you know, screen. They're like, oh yeah, I forgot about Anna. We should totally use her for this campaign. Or, you know, like, oh God, you know, I'm, I didn't, I had no idea that she worked with so-and-so. I had no idea that like we have, the, you know, the same friend in common. Like it's, it's just, it's not so much like, you know, the result is to, you know, get this X X, Y, Z job. The whole point is just kind of like putting yourself into the ether and like, yeah. and creating movement. Yeah. So, yeah, you got it. Yeah. I think they say that uh, in terms of career progress, most of the career jumps you make or promotions, whatever, come from mutual friends, not from your direct friends. So that's sure. all the more importance for that list and creating that and building that network. Because like you're saying, putting in the ether, people have to know what it is you're trying to do with your life so that yeah. they can even know to use you. You know, I could say I want to be the most popular comedian in the world, but if I'm never at any stand up clubs and I'm never at any improv places, forget the practice. If no one even yeah. knows I'm trying to do it, how am I ever going to be successful? Yes. That's big. You will, it, it, it's basically like you're building your tribe. You know, I feel like a lot of successful people that I see, they just have a good tribe. You know, they have a photographer that's like, I always love working with her, you know. So, of course, the photographer is nine times out of ten going to want you for this job. Or same with, you know, an actor. I, I love working with her. I, she's my number one. Or You know what I mean? So it's like, it's building the trust, building the tribe. And then, you know, referrals will start coming, you know, in that process. So it's, I mean, that's part of it. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Usually my last question was going to yeah. be, um, you already answered it though, was oh. what's one habit you would suggest people start doing now who are either trying to do what, uh, you're doing or any career. So you already answered it. So instead I would ask instead, what's one mindset shift that they can have right now or l try to implement that can help them with the next step, go from, to reach that aha moment and go from idea to action. I, I think that, um, one thing that's currently helped me, um, now is that whenever you come across an obstacle, like when something just didn't work out your way or if 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 someone that you're wor working with um, basically isn't you're not gelling with that person or there's just like basically a disconnect. Um, the, the thing that I've learned and I'm still practicing is trying to find three ways um, why this is working in your favor. OK. You know what I mean? Like when something because you know that's just how it is like you know things just may not go the way you want it to go but then instead of feeling um victimized from it i try to like switch it around and just be like okay let's list three positive things that came out from this and then from that point on going forward that's all you see so i just feel like it's so important just to kind of see the the good from something that may not have worked out yeah and just like going forward with that versus carrying that baggage of just like um feeling really um either hurtful or you know taking something so personally um when something just didn't you know connect with some someone or just didn't go your way um yeah it's just kind of like changing the story and making it work in your favor yeah, yeah. embracing the ups and like the downs and absolutely moving forward with moving using forward. everything to your advantage or as an opportunity that has changed that has definitely changed my life because i feel like um before i learned how to do those that simple technique um you just create stories yeah and then you believe it yeah you know we you're just a lot like of stories in our head that totally. are very false that's so false. And just hold us back tremendously. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, that was a repeating thing in my career and in my life in general because um, I created so many stories without investigating or inquiry. Yeah. We, um, like, we like to make a lot of assumptions. Absolutely. And then 
and then it just because and then it all of a sudden you didn't even question it and it's like it's become a fact in your head you know so and chances are nine out of ten times you're probably wrong right totally so i feel like um it's so much better to just kind of like reverse that and and create three positive um stories from something that you know just wasn't part of your script change the script (laughs) like change the story yeah so awesome yay (laughs) <laughs> well, that's a wrap. Anna, cool. thank you for coming on Thanks, to the podcast. Thanks, Joe, for having me. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Hopefully, uh, as this progresses, maybe we'll bring you on again for a follow-up, <laughs> see what new changes have come and whatnot. Or maybe cool. an apprentice or someone that yeah, succeeded under your yeah, totally. supervision. Cool. <laughs> thank you so much, guys, for listening. Be sure to rate and review us on iTunes and Stitcher and help our community grow. And if you haven't already, check out our YouTube channel and subscribe and see the day in the life of how these people put what they are talking about here into action.